Imperial Yeast has been up to some interesting things lately, and they recently announced a product we are super excited about. If you're familiar with Imperial Yeast, you're likely aware of their classification system. A is for ale as an AO7 flagship, L is for lager as an L17 harvest, and so on. Well, they recently released the first strain in their I series, which stands for Imperialis and refers to non-GMO hybrids or derivative yeast strains developed by Imperial Yeast that have been honed to exhibit the traits today's brewers most desire. The initial offering, I-22 Capri, is a high hybrid of A38 Juice and A43 Loki, two of Imperial's most popular strains for Hop Forward IPA. Whether you're into this style or just enjoy juicier fermentation characteristics, you have got to try I-22 Capri. Learn more about the Imperialis Project and I-22 Capri at imperialyeast.com. There have always been curious brewers who enjoy doing less conventional things with their beer, though it seems to me that over the last decade or so, the use of adjuncts has really picked up. One of the first adjuncts I recall being used with a decent amount of regularity is coffee, uh, which makes some sense because it sort of emulates the characteristics imparted by some roasted grains, so it can be quite complimentary in certain styles. Well, over the years, brewers have played around with various methods for using coffee when brewing beer, each with its own pros and cons. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Mark. Marshall Schott. And on this episode, I'm joined by contributor Andy Carter to chat about brewing with this perky adjunct, uh, focusing primarily on the differences between hot brew and cold brew coffee. Yeah, I drink all types of coffee. I'm a really big coffee fanatic. I don't think I'm a snob just yet, but you know, I do drink a lot of coffee. Um, <laughs> and you know, I love coffee and beer because I think some of the elements of beer go well with coffee, the, com- the compliment, right? The stouts, porters, the big barrel-aged beers, but also the contrast, blonde ales, uh, interesting Belgian-style beers that have coffee. Uh, so yeah, it's a fantastic ingredient uh, for beer, and I'm really happy to talk about my experience with this today. Yeah, and you know, I- I've never been a huge fan of brewing with adjuncts in general. Uh, there's just something I love about using the four main ingredients to brew standard types of beers, but that's not to say I don't appreciate the occasional adjunct beer, and I particularly enjoy what coffee can bring to the table for all the same reasons you said, Andy. Uh, thinking back, I believe I've personally brewed just one coffee beer, and I added uh, whole beans during fermentation, like a dry hop addition. Now, I know a lot more people are dosing their fermented beer with actual coffee nowadays, brewed coffee, uh, and that there are some interesting thoughts surrounding whether hot brew or cold brew is better. I also look forward to digging into this subject today. All right, if you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. This month's guest is Nick Harris from Berkeley Yeast, a company based out of the Bay Area of California, who are doing some really incredible things with yeast like bioengineering strains to produce predictably unique outcomes. Their goal being to transform the way we all think about fermentation. If you're curious about yeast uh, the same way we are, you're not going to want to miss this one. To be a part of it, you have to make your pledge over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By this Friday, October 28th, 2022, is Nick's going to be taking those questions on Saturday the 29th. All past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcast or wherever it is you're listening to podcasts, we really would appreciate it. We are we're getting really close to that 1,000 review mark in Apple Podcasts. I'd love to hit that by the end of the year uh, before 2023. And if you can help us get there, again, we would really appreciate it. To everybody out there who has already done this, left a rating and a review, uh, we are reading them. And again, we are really thankful that you've done that and appreciate what you have to say. Thank you so much. Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who in addition to having a remarkable YouTube channel chock full of great brewing-related content, sell what we believe to be some of the best electric brewing systems on the market. If you've been Considering making the jump from propane to electric, you owe it to yourself to check out Clawhammer Supply. Whether you're after a 120 volt, five gallon unit, or something larger, like their powerful 240 volt, 10 gallon system, Clawhammer has got you covered. Learn more about everything they have to offer over at clawhammersupply.com. And don't forget to check out their YouTube channel as well. 
Listener Neil Shurgan wrote in with a little tip after listening to episode 248 where we talked about our experiences packaging and shipping beer. Neil said, Pringles cans are a great solution for packaging. I travel from time to time and always travel with beer. Drop a can or bottle into a sock and the sock into a Pringles can, then wrap it with plastic wrap or seal with a zip baggie for protection. Not a bad idea, Andy. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I've ever used a Pringles can that way, but (laughs) I will say it's actually kind of ingenious because the Pringles can will both retain the beer if it leaks and give you some like crumple protection from anything else. I usually just throw clothes and all my stuff, though I will say, like I think I mentioned that episode, I electrical tape everything, so... (laughs) <laughs> so I've actually received a few beers that were packaged this way. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a pretty nifty idea. You know, uh, that Pringles can adds a little bit of structure to the outside of the bottle. Uh, and if you wrap that Pringles can in a baggie or some something else that can contain liquids, it will also help to contain any breakage, uh, you know, any yeah. beer that, that leaks out. So I do think that's a good idea. I have to imagine most people know what Pringles are. Uh, but just to be sure, they're these weird chips or crisps, as some people call them, uh, that are made of like compressed potatoes. I think they're gross, but my kids love them. Uh, Anyway, they come stacked in these tall cylindrical cans that are are kind of the perfect size for standard beer bottles and even cans. So, Mm. uh, you know, do what Neil suggested. And yeah, I think it's a solid way to further protect the bottles that you're shipping or traveling with. Really cool idea, Neil. I I appreciate you sharing that tip with us. Uh, If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or you can drop us a note on social media. So over the last couple of months, I've been encouraging all of you listeners out there to go subscribe to our YouTube channel. And a lot of you have done that. That. So we appreciate you doing that. Uh, up until recently, though, uh, that, that YouTube ca- channel consisted almost entirely of the Brewlosophy podcast and the Brew Lab episodes. Now, if you go over there, you're going to notice that there's nothing. We completely wiped the channel. Huh. Well, whatever could be happening. Well, you know, suffice to say that we've got something really neat up our sleeves that I think all of you are really going to enjoy. If you don't want to miss out on the fun and have yet to subscribe to our channel, you might want to do so now at youtube.com slash at the brewlosophy show. That's the at symbol followed by the brewlosophy show. You do not need to put the umlaut in there. All right. When we're back from this break, our focus will be on making beer with either hot brew or cold brew coffee. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. While coffee certainly isn't a primary brewing ingredient, it's been used uh, in so much beer at this point that it's kind of lost its novelty. Uh, in fact, I'd contend <laughs> the majority of breweries out there have at least one, if not more, coffee beers in their lineup. And, and I think a good part of the reason for this is that coffee offers many characteristics that do complement certain styles of beer, especially darker ones like stout. Now, we've talked about brewing with coffee way back in episode 89, where our focus was on when the coffee gets added, whereas today it's going to be on the way the coffee is prepared prior prior to adding it. Uh, So before Mm -hmm. we get into all of that, though, let's talk about brewing with coffee in general. 
Yeah, so like we said, it's not a traditional ingredient as a, like the four main ingredients of beer, but I can't remember a time there wasn't a coffee type beer somewhere. Now, of course, there's so <laughs> many more than when I started drinking, but uh, it's been around for being used in beers for um, a while. Um, it's not really in the last hundreds of so years, but you know, at least modern age beers, really a mid 1990s thing it was one of the first few commercial breweries. And of course, if you're talking about coffee, the first beer that's going to come to mind in that case is stout or porter because yeah. the dark roasty character is already existing in there. There's even, uh, types of, uh, uh it's kind of an, a side side note, but there's types of, uh, artificial coffees are you know, fake coffees that use barley grains in them huh. to make the coffee, fl- make them think like coffee, right? It's so you, if you can't drink coffee or something, you know, so, what are the first some of the breweries that started doing this red hook brewing had a beer uh with coffee dogfish head of course they were always kind of trailblazers whenever they were brewing something so i think coffee to beer is no stranger to them and the new <laughs> as well so as usually it happens with any type of brewing ingredient home brewers kind of latch on to these ingredients early on in the process especially it just the nature of home brewing is to add new things to beer because you have the opportunity to customize it as you want um and not just a stout or porter, but to Blondale. And like I mentioned earlier, Belgian style beers, they tend to take on some of those characters because the fruitiness, the phenols kind of work with some some types of coffee. So it's always been around, but, you know, it's it's just funny that you think, oh, well, when's the last time I didn't see a coffee beer? So. Yeah, yeah, it definitely. And like you said, home brewers are kind of the innovators. When it, I mean, you talk to a bunch of commercial brewers and they'll often say that they got their idea to experiment with new ingredients and whatnot from home brewers, in part because home brewers aren't risking losing necessarily losing too much money right you can spend $35 yeah. on a batch uh, five gallon batch of beer you can even make like a you know $15 one gallon batch and if it doesn't turn out oh well uh, whereas on the commercial scale obviously they have to consider uh, just their total volume and how much loss that actually uh, means so it's cool that home brewers kind of have a role in this and like like you I did some research and found that I mean I I know coffee had to be you know used in beers hundreds of years ago, uh, but it wasn't just until the mid '90s really when when we really started seeing it pop up on the commercial scene here in the states. That did align really well with the massive rise in craft brewing, so I guess that sort of makes sense. So uh, now the purpose of using coffee in beer, I think a lot of people you kind of hit on a little bit, uh, uh, Andy, and I and the best we can do really is to speculate why people are doing this. Mm. The two main reasons I can think of: one is that it emulates. Uh, certain aroma and flavor characteristics with just a little bit of a spinoff to make it unique. So you think about things like mm-hmm. golden stout, right? Golden stout actually, to me, doesn't really taste like stout, but you add that coffee and it gives the impression of a stout without the color, uh, without perhaps the richness of an American stout, something like that. So it really does allow you to kind of play around with with flavors and characteristics that you might get from roasted grains, but without adding all that comes with roasted grains. Yeah, so... You know, we like you said the roasty character. I think also there's like a little bit of astringency you're gonna get from coffee that you get there that you may not get as much in other stuff. Uh, obviously, color. Um, yeah, I mean, mostly it's this flavor that I think you get with. It's just every ingredient, right? Malt, water, hops, yeast. I mean, not water as much, but you know, malt, hops, and yeast all have these components that you can find in coffee so what if there was another way of adding it right i like to play the compare and contrast game you're getting one thing from something else and then coffee provides you another thing usually coffee gives you just that roasty character it's kind of one note and that's what people see but if you get dig dig into it even farther and there's an example i'll talk about in a little bit about where you see all the differences is that there is a lot more nuance there and then you can pull out new things you would never be able to get and you can do it with way past the uh actual brewing of the beer right you can do it way after brewing the beer too so it's a yeah. tool in your tool belt well and and you know one thing to keep in mind you got barley which is a grass uh, it's a seed, the grass seed uh and then you've got coffee which is actually the seed of a fruit uh and so and so coffee is also commonly discussed as imparting certain fruity characteristics i'll never forget this one time i am definitely not a coffee snob but i do love coffee i drink it every day i don't care if it's folgers or if it's some you know hundred dollar a glass coffee i like coffee um I was at a friend's house and he is absolutely a coffee snob. And I was telling him how I've never really picked up the fruitiness of coffee, whatever. This is probably 15 years ago. And he goes, Oh, I got something to show you. And he, and he like had this weird little box where he like ground the coffee in this. It looked like a cigar box, but he, but he milled the coffee in this. And then he made me my nice single little cup of espresso or whatever it was. And I'll tell you what, if I, it was just tasted like blueberry to me. Um, And so there are like, you think about uh, the fruitiness that coffee can impart. 
part, I think also very complimentary for certain styles. Another characteristic that I've that I've heard people discuss, and I'm not sure I've picked it up in a coffee beer before, but is and I've I've gotten this characteristic in beer, just not necessarily. I don't think it was from coffee. Is peppery, like like the flesh of a bell pepper, mm. um, and all all of that, in my to my understanding, is actually associated with coffee, and it can come from the different t- t- the way they're roasted, which again, you know, coffee and barley are roasted similarly. They they go through a similar process, so it makes sense to me that there would be kind of this carryover, this kind of uh, you know the, the, these areas where they they cross over uh, and and impart similar characteristics, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't say like that roast that 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 uh, bell pepper one is sometimes people say is a negative. I don't say it's negative or a positive. I think it's a trait. Um, it's one I'm not looking for in a beer. Yeah, I don't uh, like yeah, it. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You definitely want don't want to have it, but it is possible to get. And usually, just we're jumping ahead a little bit, but I will say that if you're looking at that, you're seeing that in your own beer. I would start treating your coffee additions like dry hop additions. And huh. even more so, just keep it cold. Like you can do cold dry hopping. I don't think I'd ever have done that before. I think I'd usually do room temperature, maybe a little lower, maybe 60, uh, 60 uh, Fahrenheit. But uh, but you should treat it like it's actually much more uh, ten, uh, tenuous. And yet I would be only adding coffee cold to limit uh, eliminate that flavor if you're seeing that in your beer. So, oh, cool. Yeah, that's a tip I've yeah. never heard. I hate that peppery character in beer. And I, it, to each their own, but not my thing. Yeah. I've never had it if the beer stays cold after adding the coffee. So yeah, that's interesting. Well, some other considerations you might want to, you know, I guess consider uh, if you're going to brew with coffee. One of them is the origin of the coffee. We know that there are certain uh, regional differences, or at least purportedly, that you know, coffee grown in Colombia is different than coffee grown in different regions of Africa, mm-hmm. and all of these things. So that's something you want to keep in mind. I do think that the uh, people who are coming up with the descriptions for these coffee, uh, these different coffees, are probably you know pretty accurate. These are experts who have done that. So just read the label uh, of the coffee that you're getting. Another one is roast level. I mean, you've got everything. Correct me if I'm wrong. I am, I am by far, again, I'm not, I'm not a coffee expert, but you've got everything from like a blonde roast all the way up to a French roast, which is very, very mm-hmm. dark. And that roast level is go, just like with grain. It's going to contribute different characteristics if used in beer. Yeah, so roast level is the... It, most people, if they start growing up, they have like a Folgers with their parents or whatever, and that's like a very dark roast, very generic. But as you, as what's happened, if you grow up and you're trying to drink coffee, trying to expand your palate of coffee, and what's happened in the last you know decade of, or so of coffee is people want more from their their cup of coffee. They don't just want pumpkin spice latte; they want a nicer cup of coffee that is just the coffee. And so that's where the blonde or the medium roast is such more important because that's when you're getting some more nuances in the coffee and. They're going to charge you more money, so there's more regionalization, more single origin, more things like that. So you get more specific flavors from it. Yeah. Another thing to consider is the type of beer you're going to be making. Uh, you know, it, it, this is just my opinion. Uh, local homebrewer, again, homebrewers are awesome because they try things out without too much risk. Local homebrewer made a, I think it was a, an American pale ale, dry hopped and everything, but in the dry hop, they tossed in some coffee. Did not do it for me. <laughs> I thought mm-hmm. it tasted pretty awful. But the idea being that, you know, that, that blend of roasty with fruity, kind of like a black IPA might work out. And it, again, not my thing, but those are the things you want to consider when you're going in. Is are is it going to be complimentary? Is it going to be clashing? Is it going to be somewhere in between? Uh, you've got to make a determination on what kind of uh, style is best for coffee. We, as we know, you can, you can add coffee to a blonde ale and it can be fantastic. I've had so many coffee blondes that I thought were really, really nice. Uh, add a little bit of lactose in there, make it kind of like a, a you know, a creamy, uh, creamy coffee concoction. Really nice. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one of my favorite uh, non-stout based coffee beers is the Naughty Sauce from a brewery down here called Noble Ale Works. They were one of the first to do it. And it's a nitro and it's got cocoa nibs and it just tastes like a cup of coffee. It's delicious, but it's a blonde beer. And that's something that maybe happened. I forgot maybe six or seven years ago that was became very trendy to do that. Um, and hey, the trend stuck. I love it. We, we, we I, I seek that kind of beer out whenever I can find it. Yeah, there's another one uh, from the East Coast I, by Carton Brewing, I believe. That's like, yes. a, I, I forget what it's called, but it sounds it's pretty good. It's good. It's called regular coffee. Right, that's right. Yeah, and it's like an imperial yeah. cream ale type of thing with coffee and, and lactose in it. I've heard great things about it. Regardless, what we're trying to say is that coffee can be used in various styles of beer, not just stout. But I do think that most commonly you're going to find coffee beers being uh, falling on that darker end of the style scale, uh, most notably with, uh, with stout uh, or as people are referring to them as coffee stout. Yeah, coffee stout. American stout or milk stout, but the comparison here being it's big, it's a bit bigger beer. Uh, usually, American stouts are bigger than you know your other other v- variants. They're in the 
just the roast level, alcohol level, all those things, bitterness, and not like a dry stout. Like a Guinness is more like a four or five percent. Actually, the irony, you know, everyone says Guinness is a big beer. It's a meal, but honestly, <laughs> it's like the it's like the probably le- best caloric advantage you could have if you're going to drink a beer. So yeah, yeah. Uh, to each their own. But yes, um, you know, it's it's the process of roasting coffee. I've done it actually at home a few times. It's actually really easy to do. You get green. They're literally green beans. They're this green dry beans. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a moisture, a little more moisture content still in them. And then you just turn them in a, either they use a Jiffy pop, which is like an old school uh, po- popcorn maker on the stove where you can spend, you don't even spend that much money, a couple hundred bucks. And you actually have a small co- uh, roaster, which you can control the roast then, right? We talked about uh, light, medium, dark. You can control the roast. And there's these processes called like first crack, second crack, crack all these different things that's when the liquid and air uh moist air is coming out of the uh bean itself and changing and processing and then you have your coffee and i know people that do it they love doing it it's a lot of fun little thing you can do at home with your coffee sure that roast process just like any type of roasted grain every producer every maker is gonna be a little different origins are different that kind of thing unlike barley where it's kind of like one and done with your two row or whatever and there's small variations with the being the like marshall said the seed of a fruit there's so much more nuance and regionality to a coffee bean so yeah i and you know uh, you you when when thinking about using uh coffee in a beer you think about all of the things coffee tastes like and one of the things that makes so much sense to me you know i i I tend to prefer my coffee either black or with just a little bit of cream in it or half and half or even creamer just to cool it down so i can drink it uh but i'm not a sugar guy in my coffee and so when i drink coffee i i it does there are parts sometimes I'll, i'll swallow a sip of my morning coffee and think wow you know, I, I, it, if this was cold and carbonated, it would kind of taste like a stout. So it makes sense that those would work well together. So when using uh, coffee and beer, some methods for adding coffee, the first thing you got to think about is where do you want to add the coffee? You can, this is one of those ingredients that you can start at the very beginning with a mash. I mean, you could, you could throw coffee in your mash. You are going to extract my understanding. I've never done it, but from what I've read online is that when you do that, it's sort of like you're brewing coffee. So you will extract perhaps a little bit more color than you might if that coffee addition came a little bit later. Um, And so you can go from the mash, the boil, you could add it during fermentation, you could add it to the keg. Uh, And I think a lot of people these days are kind of swaying more towards keg additions or post-fermentation coffee additions in part to avoid extracting certain characteristics like that peppery thing uh, that they may not want in their beer. Yeah. And I've had uh, there's an example I, I always go back to that's one of the eye-opening examples of using coffee and beer. The brewery, the brewery, B-R-U-E-R-Y, down in Orange County, California, they had a pilot system a few years ago where you could uh, they would do a beer and then do like five or six different variations. And they did literally like six different coffees. Yeah. Some were espresso pulls, some were in the mash, some were all this. And every one, you, it was a red ale, which is kind of cool, right? Another non-traditional beer to add yeah. to uh, coffee to but you can get that you get that caramel that rose that kind of works with a lot of actually coffee beverages right macchiatos that kind of thing yeah so you get uh what i got was actually excellent coffee representation across the spectrum of beers but each was its own each was different and it's just like oh that made me really scratch my head and that's what really opened my eyes up to it really you can add it however you want um, i i'm more of a fan of the cold edition but you know that's what that's me well, and another thing that I that I think about is, you know, you, you, we were talking about how coffee is often used in American stout, which tends to be a bit more stiff than dry stout. I mean, it is going to be stronger than a dry stout. And where do you get that strength from? It's from more grain. And when you add more grain, you're also boosting up that sweetness. And people like their coffee to have a little bit of sweetness to balance that bitterness. It just makes a ton of sense. And then the other one, a coffee milk stout. I mean, if you've not had a cream stout or a milk stout that's had a coffee edition, you got to try it. That is one of my favorites. It's a uh, uh, house of Pendragon here locally is one of their kind of flagship uh, stouts is the, is is uh, a Cocoa Crusader, which is a, I believe it's a milk stout that just has coffee and chocolate and it. it's really nice. Um, and that's another one. You add coffee, you can add chocolate, you can add lactose, you can add something sweet, you know, all kinds of options when playing with coffee. Yeah. So yeah, in true. addition to the point of addition, one thing you want to think about, and this is kind of where we're headed, is, is the way you're going to prepare that coffee. Are you going to use whole beans? Are you going to grind that coffee before you add it to the mash or the boil or to your fermentation? Uh, your ferment fermenter, are you going to brew that coffee? Uh, and I think there are different arguments. I know there are different arguments uh, for each one of these options. Uh, I, I don't have too much personal experience with all of them because like I said, I've, I've brewed one coffee beer. 
Uh, but I've tasted various types of beers uh, brewed using these different preparations of coffee. And I do think there might be some differences here. Um, whole beans to me seems the easiest and actually does without even grinding the, the, the beans. It actually works pretty well. Uh, if you toss in a bag of whole, gr- of, of whole beans into your uh, fermentation uh, vessel or into your keg, you are going to extract coffee character. Absolutely. And that's actually, I'll, I've iterated over the different types. And as I've iterated, I've just done less processing to all my ingredients. And one was coffee, just whole beans would, would eat the, ban- the advantage to me. And I see it as a good advantage, especially at the homebrew scale, is you get time. The absorption time, the extraction time is actually delayed because it's not ground up, right? The surface area to volume ratio. So you can actually kind of dial in a flavor that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get with a uh, ground coffee or a liquid addition. Yeah, it's cool. And I mean, and that's the thing is you're going to choose what works best for you and what you have found to have the best results. For many people, those best results have come from brewing their coffee and then adding that coffee at some point uh, in the in the process. Usually, it, again, based on my conversations with people who brew with coffee a lot and what I can find on the internet, usually the coffee is added at the point of packaging. Uh Andy, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but some seem to believe that that if you take the coffee as it's brewed, and there are different ways to prepare that coffee that we'll get to, and you add it to the keg, that you are you are basically maintaining the freshness of that coffee flavor in the way that most people expect coffee to taste. Yeah, and I would agree. I think that's the the quickest way to get you the the whatever you're making, right? I think this is go, goes with even bigger things like cooking or other other brewing techniques. Is if you can make it one way and then put it in, that's the best way. Now that you have to ask other questions about that addition, not just the flavor you're getting, but how stable is it? How quickly do I need to drink right. it? Is it going to change those kind of things? But I would say like a grain uh, or a, a, a seed to glass, so to speak. Right? You know, this is the way to do it. That's like the the way to capture that f- specific flavor. Yeah. 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 Now. When you think about hot versus cold brew, we're going to go over how that's done in, in, in basics real quick. But it, the, way, the, the way the arguments about each of those goes reminds me so much of brewing in general and the way that people, <laughs> the way that people glom on to their opinions about, you know, if you, if you mash for too long or if you stir during the mash or if you hot side aeration and yada, yada, yada. There's all of these ideas that people maintain are fact when actually they're just their opinions. And in the same way, I I can't help but wonder as kind of a coffee outsider, if that's not what's kind of going on with the hot versus cold brew thing in general. The thing is, I drink cold brew quite often. I, I, when Mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning, we have a standard, you know, Cuisinart uh, coffee maker that we put our Folgers coffee in and that's what gets me going in the morning. But if I'm out and about with my family, you know, and the girls are all wanting a, their 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 sweet coffee frozen drinks. Yeah, I, I will usually get a wherever we're at nowadays. It's really rad. You can actually find like cold brew on nitro. I love it. Oh, yeah. I love that stuff. And to me, it tastes very qualitatively different than hot brewed coffee. Yes. Is it because of the temperature? Is it because I'm expecting there to be a different? I don't know. I've never done a side by side, but I I believe the argument is that well they do taste different, and so if you use those in your beer, they're also going to impart different characteristics to that beer. Absolutely. Um, I'm much more on the hot coffee side. I I have uh, all the nice little things for hot coffee brewing. Although I do drink cold brew, and my lovely girlfriend who uh, is a prodigious cold brew drinker um i mean every day there's a cold brew uh and she's got she really knows there's a difference she can tell that difference and, and it's just the flavor they that's the smoothness richness the yeah. character of the cold brew and that does come from processing it's like brewing right if you process the ingredients differently you're probably gonna end up with a different result a quantitatively qualitatively sure but quantitatively different result in terms of acidity lower acidity from cold brew um it's just the flavors you're going to get and then the, the shelf stability you really the cold brew is going to just stay more cold brew flavored longer than a hot beverage would. Well, I'll tell you, uh, when, when I drink a cold, the first time I had a cold brew, uh, it was not poured on, on nitro, which that's my favorite way. I do think that, mm. that that nitrogenated coffee just adds this creamy sweetness that I don't know, you're not adding sugar and it still has this just really pleasant kind of background sweetness that I love. Even when it's not on nitro though, 
It is uh, it, the best way to describe it, which I know that this is overdone, is smooth. It is so yeah. smooth and creamier on, in, in my mouth, uh, perceptibly at least, than when I'm drinking something hot. But at the same time, if I drink hot water, you know, if I take a sip of hot water and I take a sip of the same exact water that's cold next to it, I perceive those as, quote, tasting different as well. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if it's it's temperature at the time of my drinking. You know, this is just the way my brain thinks. We've been doing this experimental stuff for way too long for me not to think this way. But it, it is interesting, and I but I do understand the argument that if you use hot brew in a beer, uh, that it that it will taste different than if you were to use cold brew. That's basically similar preparation, just cold, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So so Andy, you are the kind of the expert when it comes to preparing hot brew. If you can kind of give us a rundown of the different ways people might yeah. might produce hot brew. Yeah. So the most common way you're you're going to experience it probably the first time you have a cup of coffee, especially like coffee. They said coffee is like the first thing. It's an acquired taste, right? And you usually acquire that when you're in the United States. You acquire that uh, waking up in the morning. Your parents are coming a cup of yeah. coffee. Usually <laughs> that coffee, unless well now maybe nowadays maybe we're experiencing differently growing up. But at least yeah. how I grew up was it was a, a a drip coffee, right? A traditional coffee machine where there is a basket and hot water is poured or or, or sputtered over the coffee beans and it drips through, right? You can also do a French press, which is a, more of a cylinder where the hot water is mixed directly at once, not dripped, not not strained. This would be batch sparging versus fly sparging in the case of this case. <laughs> it's so true. Of a, of, of, a, of a drip machine, right? It's a batch sparge process, and then you push it down. That usually has just a different character. I, I, I tend to not do that. There's just a little messier. Honestly, it's more of a process concern than anything else. Yep. Um, I can do w- what I do, and that's my favorite because uh, I don't want to have the coffee machine. Um, though coffee machines work great, right? It's usually for like quantity right your coffee machine on the side is like when you need cups and cups and cups yeah if you need a cup pour over is the best and you can get very fancy with it i do i have a i have a the right grinder for the beans i have this fancy uh spouted um uh, pour over thing for it and that's the pour over is like the drip but like one cup of coffee and you can control how fast you pour you know how much do you let the grains warm up afterwards all these little things that what the condo servers will say is like the best way to serve a cup of coffee because it's got all the control in it so that's like hot brewed and then of course there's espresso machines and all the other ways of extracting the flavor from coffee. Yeah, I'll tell you, some of the best hot coffee I've ever had, I was walking through New York City uh, b- before my my sister's wedding, God, about 10 years ago now, and uh, we, we, you know, it was a cool, cool morning, and we're kind of walking downtown, first time in New York City, and there's a little coffee, little coffee stand in, under this tunnel, I'll, I'll never forget, and I saw them doing a pour over, but I'd never seen it before, you know, and I, so I asked what it was, and she's like, you know, lady's like, it's pour over, you want a cup? Said, sure. I, straight black coffee have never has never tasted so good to me. Uh, so I actually ha- do have a pour over set as well. I'm just far too lazy and like more volume uh, with, you know, my wife drinks coffee. My oldest daughter drinks coffee. So if I was making pour over for all three of us, it'd become a pain in the butt. And so we, yeah. I, I tend to stick with the, the simple drip these days, but I do really enjoy pour over. That'd be an interesting comparison as well, right? Like drip versus yeah. pour over or something. Yeah, but, absolutely. So preparing cold brew is actually quite easy. I, I when it first started be- getting talked about, I, I was like, God, oh, what a process. What whatever. It's actually really easy, especially if you've got some like muslin brew bags that you haven't mm-hmm. used for hops yet. Uh, they're perfect. You just grind up your coffee, put it in, put it in one of those bags, drop it into some water, and then you can either leave that water on your counter, or I know a lot of people will throw that into their fridge. That's what I've done and leave it overnight. And it is, it's fantastic. <laughs> the coffee ends up yeah. tasting really good. And honestly, I've done it with really nice coffee. I've done it with cheap Folgers coffee and it's good either way. And, it, and to me, it does taste different. Um, are there specifics that I'm missing there. I, I don't do this often. I, every once in a yeah. while, I'll get the itch. But are there things that you do specifically to ensure a good result when you're making cold brew? Um, I think all, really what it gets to is your water. I mean, I think the water matters more in my opinion than it does for hot coffee because you're. It's when we're. It's when you're having colder, or hot, and it's usually more. Temp, uh, you know, time sensitive, like it's poured, you're drinking it, you're not so concerned with water. The water matters. Um, I think I take a little more serious with the water. Uh, that's kind of just my how I've processed it. The one thing I'll say is you need more coffee. Uh, it's just not as an efficient process as hot coffee is. Sure. So you need to kind of up it uh, to get the same kind of flavor. You can also kind of, since it it's not as well you know well done, or there's kind of known uh, rules of thumb for hot brew. Like cold brew, you have to kind of look a little bit, get your flavor right. Some people do double strength batching, and then they dilute later. Yeah. So they try to like really concentrate it. Uh, but no, you really nailed it. That's exactly what I do. And what's nice is the homebrew shops actually kind of have the, the stuff you need to do cold brew yep. at, at scale, right? Because there's a lot of like simple ones, like little like you only make a 
cup or two at a time that's kind of like not efficient right because it does take two to like i i would say a day is like on the low end it would take two to three days to brew it, especially if you put it cold in the fr- in the in the uh, fridge what i like to do is i get a nylon bag do the coarsest grind possible or ask them to do the coarsest grind possible pour all the coffee in there pour the water in there and i get one of those one gallon uh plastic fermenters from the homebrew shop that uh-huh. has a, a wide mouth lid so the whole bag can go in there and i do about um, a bag of coffee has changed a little bit. It's usually 12 ounces. I've seen them, uh, shrinkflation is occurring and there's about 10 ounce bags. Now, so watch out, but <laughs> 10, 12, 12 to like 14 ounces in about a gallon of water or the balance of the fermenter in water. And that's a good ratio for me in terms of the flavor. And then I wait about two days and you can, uh, the nice one is those ones that have this, the, they're like for monsters now, but they're one gallon size. Yeah. They have a spout on, they have a spout on them too. So you can just spout out the, uh, cold brew immediately into a growler or what have you uh, after that. And it works really well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And also just, a, I, I have a friend who, who really loves cold brew and she went and got a, uh, you, you can buy like these cold brew kits and she brought, yeah. she, I was over at her house, you know, we're over hanging out and she's making this coffee and, and I'm looking at her going that on, you could spend a quarter of the price <laughs> and you, and yeah. get away with the same exact thing, you know, but people are, you know, I get it. People, people are innovative and want to make a, a, a buck, but uh, if you want to make cold brew, it's just as easy as getting, like you said, just getting some sort of a vessel, getting a little bag and uh, steeping those, steeping those grind, grounds of coffee in, in the cold water. So, well, like I said before, I am by no means a coffee snob, but I do drink the stuff daily and uh, usually hot brew you know, from my standard drip coffee maker, though, like I said, I do really enjoy some cold brew. In fact, I've got a plan to surprise my kids with a, a little Starbucks run a little bit later today. Uh, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't perceive there as being a noticeably, you know, smoother uh, 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 on the palate experience that I have when I'm drinking cold brew. Uh, it's less astringent, seems to be a little bit less bitter. I like the astringency and bitterness I get from hot coffee. But if that's true, that it is perceptibly different on those fronts, then I would presume that it would impart similar uh, characteristics to beer, but does it? Well, that's exactly what we aim to find out in a couple of past experiments, the results of which we're going to be discussing when we're back from this break. Family owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus, Atlantic Brew Supply has an on site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. If there's one thing I know about brewers, it's that we love to eat just as much as we love to drink. And when I eat, I put hot sauce on pretty much everything. Lately, that hot sauce has come from Atlanta Burns, whose mission is to make uniquely flavored spicy hot sauces that add a new dimension to your meal. Based out of Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta Burns uses only the highest quality ingredients to produce handcrafted hot sauces like Jalapeno Business and my personal favorite, Sherman's Ghost. It's so good. Right now, Atlanta Burns is offering listeners of the Brewlosophy podcast an exclusive discount of 10% off their line of killer hot sauces. Just head over to ATL burns.com and use code brewlosophy at checkout again that's atlburns.com and code brewlosophy to get 10 percent off your order after a long brew day the last thing i want to do is waste more time chilling wort i've tried so many different options and ultimately i settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by jaded brewing with the king cobra and hydra i'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Coffee beers are a dime a dozen these days, and homebrewers have been a driving force behind a lot of the innovation when it comes to how coffee is being used in the brewing process. Like many, uh, we've been curious about how adding hot brewed coffee to a stout post-fermentation compares to using cold brewed coffee, and contributor Jason Cipriani tested it out back in 2018. 
Yeah. So we had two five gallon batches of a simple stout recipe on 120 volt all electric all in one systems. 90% Pilsner malt, 10% roasted barley. Doesn't really get much more simple than that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you it, when you look at that, there there's a part of me that's like, well, if he did just added a little bit of flaked barley, that'd have been a dry stout. But I but again, you know, when we're when we're designing the recipes for these experiments, we really are trying to isolate the variable as much as possible. And so 10% Pilsner malt with 10% roasted barley, you really are just getting the stout part of the stout, which would mean that any coffee additions are only going to contribute the uniqueness which i think is pretty neat i think it's smart so brewing process mash both at 154 fahrenheit or 68 degrees celsius and the mashes rest were complete remove the grains and sparge to collect identical pre-boil volumes both worts uh, were then boiled for 60 minutes uh, some hop additions here 21 grams of magnum at 60 for bittering 14 grams of hers brucker at 30 and then 21 grams of hers brucker at 10 uh, 10 minutes left in the boil. So yeah. after the boil, worts were chilled, reacted fermenters. He took a OG reading and it was the same at 1059. Sorry, 1049, excuse me. Uh, we use, uh, he used the less lifter work to make a vitality starter of Imperial Yeast AO7 flagship, which he spun on a stir plate uh, while those fermenters were chilling down to pitching temp. After a few hours of uh, chilling, the yeast starter was evenly split between batches and the beer was fermenting at 66 Fahrenheit or 19 degrees Celsius. After about a week of fermentation, uh, he took some hydrometer rings to see where the beers were. And, and um, as expected, the beers are both at 10, 11 finishing gravity when completed. So, so far, so good. Everything is identical between these beers, which is just, a, again, a testament to uh, Jason's uh, consistency between batch consistency when brewing on separate uh, uh, you know, systems. I think that's pretty rad. 1049 down to 1011. You're looking at right around that 5%, uh, you know, 5.2 or so percent mark in terms of uh, how alcoholic these beers are, which I think is perfect. You're adding that coffee now to try to up the flavor without too much alcohol too much uh you know malt character getting in the way of it uh and so and so that now it came came time for uh just for jason to add those coffees so he started off by preparing the cold brew coffee one morning or one day by combining six ounces or 170 grams of fresh ground beans he did use a, a hoity-toity coffee as jersey would refer to it <laughs> a nicer a nicer uh, local coffee i believe is, is what he used uh which uh, and he combined it in 30 fluid ounces or 0.9 liters of cold water and then he let it steep in his refrigerator for about 18 hours before stra uh, straining the the coffee liquor out he then made at that at that time he hot brewed some coffee using an aeropress uh, he used identical amounts of beans and water for this uh, to keep things as even as possible i know you said andy that there is some argument that in order for cold brew to be as strong as hot brew that you'd either need to use more coffee or let it steep for longer so that again that's another function of this variable are we going to get a way with a di are we going to perceive a difference uh, and if so would it be attributable to this piece of it who knows uh, so again he used identical volumes of coffee 24 ounces or 0.71 liters that were added to each batch of beer uh, and the way he did that was that uh, after uh, sanitizing he sanitized and purged his kegs then he gently poured uh, either the cold brew or the hot brew into their respective kegs and then he racked the beer on top of those coffees uh, to combine them he then placed those kegs in his keezer where they were allowed to condition for a week or so before they were ready for evaluation now before we get to the results i just want to spend some time kind of blowing hard a little bit about the way jason approached both of these he he did the 18 hour steep in the fridge with the cold brew what would you expect from doing that? 18 hours seems long enough to me from what I've done. I did 12 hours one time and the mm -hmm. coffee, the cold brew coffee I made tasted perfectly fine. It was strong, very coffee, like very tasty. And I left it in the fridge as well. So I know that there are some arguments against that. What, what say you, Andy? Um, honestly, I think this is perfectly good. This is the right amount of, this is going to show you good coffee character and the amount of time. Um, it's the ratios I would be doing too. I think in the end it's, it, it is splitting hairs about how much time you do it. I, I think this is plenty of time. So, so, so for the cold brew, he, the, the 18 hours would be good enough for that coffee to have coffee flavor, for, you know, to Absolutely. taste good. Okay. So then what in the world is an AeroPress? Again, as a coffee, <laughs> as a nonstop <laughs> coffee nerd, uh, AeroPress at first when he, when, you know, when I read this article, I'm thinking, oh, that's just, it's like mine's a Cuisinart. His is an AeroPress. Yeah. But I saw the picture yeah. and I'm going, okay, that is not a standard drip uh, coffee maker. Correct. Correct. So yeah, that was one we did not cover at the original section about different ways of doing coffee. AeroPress is a more, is a newer one. It is somewhere between a pour over and something like espresso. I'm not going to claim it's either. <laughs> um, it's a, there are a, a kind of AeroPress nerds out there that will cl claim uh, what flavor does. What it is, is, is a way of doing pour over, 
right? Because it's one cup of coffee, uh, but or you know, a, you know, a single serving or something like that. He made more coffee than that, but he did yeah. a few different batches. But it's been for a single cup. But you uh, push it, you push air through a puck of coffee. So it's a very small amount of coffee that's poured into a cup, right? So it's got those p- pour over elements, but it's not as much coffee. And some people, you know, purport the flavor is different, but it leaves huh. you with kind of a puck of coffee at the end. So it has that like espresso kind of like pressure vibe to it, so okay. to speak. So you get this thing, which is really, it is mostly, it doesn't have nearly the same kind of pressure levels as espresso does, of course, but you have this um, cup that has the kind of something in between it. And it's just another way of doing single serve coffee. So Okay. Well, so I think it's important then to point out that, that the way that his hot coffee was prepared may have an impact as well, right? You, Absolutely. It, it could be that AeroPress coffee, uh, when added to beer, has, has a unique impact when compared to, say, drip or French press or yeah, something like that. Absolutely. So we are not, again, any, any statements that we make are not statements of fact. I, I can say that till I'm blue in the face, regardless of what the variable is. But at the same time with this one, any statements that we make about if there is a difference with hot coffee uh, uh, creating a different, you know, uh, perceptibly different characteristic than cold brew coffee, it could be the AeroPress. That, that could be the reason for it doing that. So we need to keep that in mind. Now, I have uh, a Nespresso machine. Is that a similar? Nespresso, you're using little uh, pods, kind of like a Keurig, but they are, yep. in my opinion, that taste far better than Keurig coffee. I cannot stand Keurig coffee. Uh, yeah. It's not strong enough, but there are these little pods that that does uh, pr- use pressure to press water, hot water through coffee grounds or espresso grounds into a small cup. Uh, is that kind of the same idea? Just, just you can use your own coffee or... Yeah, a little bit. I, I think AeroPress is definitely not the level of again pressure that a, a mechanical tool would have, um, and it is that just that single press thing. I honestly, I I had an AeroPress uh, fifteen years ago when I was a uh, way way in college or whatever, and I had not looked at it since. And I, it, I'm sure it's in a landfill somewhere. But <laughs> I know there's a lot of AeroPress fanatics out there, so I would, if you're interested in, I would read more about it. But there's there's a lot of different things you can do with it. But it is a, it's its own an, another its own way, um, and some people prefer it over other methods. So well, it's a, it's another way. It sounds like to me to make coffee that is that that coffee snobs would say is better than drip coffee. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. There 100%. you go. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, to get away from the different ways of brewing hot coffee, uh, identical volumes of coffee. Again, 24 ounces or about 0.71 liters of coffee were added to these sanitized and purged kegs, and then the beers were transferred on top of those. Those kegs were placed in Jason's Keezer, where they were allowed to condition for a week before they were ready for evaluation. Now, in side-by-side comparisons, just in terms of the way they look, you can go check out the article now and look at the pictures, and they look absolutely identical to me. They're both dark black. Chances are that blackness was very minimally, you know, uh, influenced by the coffee addition itself because these were stouts with 10% roasted barley that uh, made them dark enough anyway. So it doesn't seem to me that the coffee, again, to my eyes, Andy, you you can have a different opinion, of course, but it doesn't seem to me the coffee addition had any impact on the way these beers looked. Yeah, not at all. I see that same beer. It's not, not, and I would not expect it. Coffee adds color, but not at the level people think it does. <laughs> That's why you can get away with golden stout <laughs> and the beer exactly. stays golden, right? It doesn't contribute exactly. much color. Now, again, I, I do, I, I did hear from somebody one time who used something like half a pound of coffee in their mash and did notice a, a slight darkening of the work color. I, I that makes sense to me. You're letting that co- sure. ground coffees, you know, steep just like you would with coffee. So now, uh, so, so Jason, this was pre COVID. Thankfully, Jason did do, uh, 10 triangle test attempts though himself semi blind so he he obviously knew the variable but he did everything he could to blind himself from which beers were in which cups uh, and went through and did what, what we now refer to as our COVID protocol uh, for, for self administered triangle tests which is where we do four cups two are marked uh, two are unmarked the same beer goes into the two that are marked the other beer goes into the two that are unmarked and then we randomly select three of those and perform a series of triangle tests that way uh, one of the benefits fits to this is that the odd beer out is regularly it's randomized basically and so uh, that's one thing that's a little bit different than the way we administer triangle tests to others out of those 10 triangle test attempts Jason chose correctly just half the time he got five uh, right uh, but that means he got five wrong so that is not consistent enough for us to say even despite being completely aware of what the variable was and you know having in his mind what to expect those differences to be five out of ten just is not consistent enough to say that 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 difference 
difference was uh, that that Jason could reliably, you know, distinguish the difference between these beers, which I think again is fascinating because this is a guy who who at least likes coffee enough to own an AeroPress, right, uh, and mm-hmm. still could not could not reliably tell these beers apart, which speaks volumes. You know, you think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I've been here so many times where I'm like dead to rights. I know this is gonna I'm gonna tell a difference, and then you're wrong. And so, <laughs> Feels good, it. doesn't humbling. it, Andy? Humbling, uh, yeah, it's humbling. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, Jason then went on to to serve these uh, the the actual triangle test to 20 participants out of which 11 would have had to identify the unique sample uh, in order for us to say that that there's a significant finding that that tasters could reliably distinguish these beers uh, but in the end only five did which is just 25 percent again you have to get at least a certain amount over 33.3 percent of tasters have to be able to uh, get the triangle test right in order for us to say that yeah maybe there is really a difference here that that difference is more than just random guessing uh, but that was not the case here which allows us to say, at least for this experiment, using this very simple stout with the tasters that Jason found, uh, that that the whether hot brew using an AeroPress or cold brew uh, using the process Jason used, uh, there people just could not seem to taste a difference, which which seems to suggest that any differences that were there were just minimal enough as to be imperceptible. Uh, that you know, pretty pretty shocking on the on the surface, but I think when you kind of dig a little bit deeper, you're only adding such a I mean, you're adding such a small amount of that brewed coffee to the beer anyways, that it would make sense to me that any nuances uh, just aren't strong enough to overcome or overpower the stout characteristics anyway. So all you're getting is that basic coffee flavor to complement the stout. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, to me, it was so interesting because of the one we're going to talk about with my, my uh, attempt at this as well is that you would think there'd be some difference because the processing is so different. And maybe, you know, like we said, I perceive a difference between hot and cold brew, but maybe that's it. Or yeah. like we've alluded to, it's just so little that the coffee elements, the primary coffee elements are, and from both are coming through, right? It is the same coffee in the end. Yeah. Primary yep. flavor, coffee flavor elements, coffee aroma is there, but the secondary stuff is so little compared to the beer, right? Because the beer is still a major ingredient, right? So that, that you just don't get it. And so, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, like I said, I think think i was expecting these to come back uh with significance but they were not so yeah i i didn't know what to expect uh and and honestly just i I kind of stopped expecting too much (laughs) because of what we found so far uh, over the years uh but you did during the kind of towards the beginning of covid when we had to stop collecting actual data uh from from actual participants you decided to repeat this experiment uh on your own Uh, we're not going to go over as much detail as we did with jason's uh but suffice to say you brewed up two fairly simple stout recipes, uh, one of which you added cold brew to uh, in the keg and the other of which you added hot brew to. Go through us a little bit about your process for making the cold brew and the hot brew and how that might differ from the way Jason did it. Yeah, yeah. So I did. uh, So for the uh, cold brew steep, you know, you need time ahead of time. So you do that ahead of making the hot brew, hot brew beat right right when you're kegging. The six ounces are 170 grams of this fresh ground coffee, now very coarse ground uh, uh, just a generic, it was probably a modern times coffee or something that has roast character to it. Yeah. Uh, it's a little heavier, not necessarily blonde or definitely light. I used a little darker roast that just gives the coffee flavor a little nicer. And that was in 30 ounces or, or, or 0.9, uh, liters of cold water with a 20 hour steep in the refrigerator. So this is very simple, uh, steeping process, a little longer than him, but you know, it's still, that's kind of my you know, MO of that 20, sure. 48 hours. So 24 hours. So it's 20 in this case, a hot brew, same amount of coffee. I wanted to make sure we were replicating the process as much as possible, uh, to make a, to get the same volume, right? Cause with hot brew, you're grinding less, uh, grinding more fine. Your extractions are higher. Uh, so you can get more liquid. So you have to kind of balance the two ratios out so that you want to have the same in same volume of liquid in the end that would be make you would make that would make sense that those would have similar amounts of quote unquote coffee particulate or whatever you want to call it in the final batch. Yep. So cool. And then after cleaning uh, kegs, purging them with all the CO2 and making them sure there's no oxygen, I gently added the coffee to each of these kegs and then they uh, carved for about three weeks. And then I did my own uh, blind triangle test. Marshall, maybe you want to remind everyone how we do these? Yeah. So so during COVID protocol uh, or our COVID protocol uh, 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 triangle test, self-administered triangle test, the way we would do that, I explained earlier, uh, is what Jason did uh, back way back in 2018. Ooh, that's that's freaky. Maybe he's... <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you did basically you did 10 of your own triangle tests. You had those four cups, two that were different, uh, for the two each being different from each other. Uh, and then 
then and then uh, you know randomizing which beer is the odd beer out in order for out of those ten in order for us to say that you were able to reliably tell these beers apart you'd have had to get seven of your triangle test attempts correct and in the end how many did you get right Andy only two baby just two. Uh, you knew everything that anybody could possibly know about these beers. You knew how the coffee was prepared. You knew where it was added. You knew how each, uh, in your mind, tastes differently uh, from each other. And yet, in this stout that you made with the with this, uh, you know, these different coffees prepared different ways, added to each one, you simply could not tell a difference. What was your experience like drinking those beers? I mean, yeah, like I said, I thought I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get these. I know these this process is different. And yeah, the beers were honestly the same. Good coffee aroma. Good coffee flavor a bit of the stout here and there um but yeah i was shocked because i i you know i had really championed um brewing with cold brew uh, if i was going to be asked how i would add coffee to beer i would tell you the cold brew method i i used yeah and i was like well i don't know how this is this is this hot brew going to be different it's going to be less i still like a lot of hot coffee i drink that all the time <laughs> um, but yeah i mean it's interesting to me that they come off so similarly again i think this goes to the to the nature of the ingredient how much you're adding is it's adding that first layer of coffee but the l- more subtlety between processes is just buried in the beer. I think. I think that's what where where it goes. So yeah. Well, I mean, I would love to do a side by side cold brew, hot brew, coffee comparison. The problem is you're mm-hmm. going to be able to tell them apart because one's hot and one's cold. So, so yeah. And I really do. I mean, I guess you could like make them the same temperature, so you'd have to let the hot brew cool down. But then then you're kind of losing the 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 whole difference. You know, I I don't know. Yeah, like, ice ice coffee is really the 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 middle ground, right? If you can't get a cold brew, which takes time, right? It takes days. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you get a hot, you get a cold, you get a hot coffee poured over ice, or in maybe our case, we counterflow chill it or something like that, right? Where yeah. you're getting that cold, cold beverage and seeing how different they are. I think that's one way to do it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's super interesting. What I'd love to see, I mean, basically these findings, we got two experiments now that just seem to suggest that cold brew or hot brew are going to do the same thing to your beer. I know there are people out there who are like, no way, that's just not true. Well, maybe it's not, but based on our findings and what we've been able to to test out, it, it does seem to be more accurate than than people out there just kind of uh, whimsically purporting, you know, that that uh, one produces a different result than the other. And I'll t- I'll fall I'll fall back on data before I fall on somebody else's opinion. Now I would. Would love to see something like a cold brew or hot brew versus, say, dry beaning, as people are referring to it, right? Yeah, Adding those beans yes. to the fermenter or to the keg, uh, because I maybe there's a difference there. And if one of those produces more of that peppery character than the other, then I would know right off the bat. I'm just going to avoid that because I can't stand that. Um, so there's yeah. a lot more exploration that we that we get to do, and we will be doing in the future, I'm sure. Now, I've liked the beers that I've known were dosed with whole beans, so that is probably the way that I would stick with doing it if ever I'm going to make a coffee beer again what what is what are you going to do uh, after after having performed this yourself knowing what jason's results were i guess in my mind i'm more open to doing hot side additions of coffee after seeing this um i was really against anything before pitching in terms of pitching yeast before adding coffee huh. i'm much much more interested in exploring those now given the results we've seen and seeing what kind of flavor it gets i know people yeah. like you said people add a, a espresso beans to the mash ton um, I'm actually a little more interested in that now because of the success I saw with hot pour. Uh, but that being said, the other reason to do it is time and process like, oh, shoot, you know, I have this beer I made and I want to add coffee because I like the beer, but maybe I want to add a little uh, edge to it. Well, do I have time to make cold brew? No, not really. Okay, well, I'll just pour a big stiff cup of coffee into it and then uh, I'll be fine. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those, those are kind of your options. The nice thing is, let's say you make a stout or you make a Blondale and you're like, God, this is just boring. You could probably get away with brewing up a quick pot of coffee, chilling it down and then add, you know, gently adding it to your keg uh, to, to, to spice things up a little bit, which I think is kind mm-hmm. of interesting. I mean, it, it's immediate, you know. So, well, we did get a couple of reader comments I'd like to get to. The first one comes from Chuck, who says, my favorite way of introducing Introducing uh, coffee to beer is to cold brew, but with beer instead of water. Oh, that's interesting. He says, I use my French press filled with about eight tablespoons of rough ground locally roasted beans. I equi- equate one tablespoon to one cup of joe uh, with, as mu- with as much post-fermented beer that'll fit. I let it sit for 36 hours, add it to the keg, and then force carb. So this is fascinating. Rather than using water for his cold brew, he's actually taking the uncarbonated fermented beer which to me poses the risk of oxidation, but oh, you, you're only oxidizing that small amount. So would it really have a huge impact on the beer? According to Chuck, it seems to work fairly well. 
Uh, not a bad idea. I think that's a good way of uh, not diluting the beer, though. I think you're not adding too much water to begin with. So it's a it's a processing. I get always uh, wary of uh, oxidizing beer. It's just such a strong flavor. I'm so sensitive to it. Uh, but it is a way to do it. And if you have extra beer, then why not? Right? If you have it from the <laughs> fermenter or whatever it is, it's fine. So yeah, I good good tip, Chuck. I, if anybody else tries out Chuck's idea here, let us know. I'd be curious how that works out for you. Uh, final comment comes from Chris Allmeyer, who says, uh, "Why not try adding roasted coffee beans instead of or in addition to the." Ro- Roasted barley grains in the mash. Very interesting idea here. Yeah, I think this is a good one. This is one actually I want to explore next, given that people have had such success with it and the flavor carries through. I was worried that the flavor would be muted or one dimensional. Um, and the ones I've had were good. So it made me kind of think, okay, well, maybe this is reevaluated. And it's also just, it's in there, it's done. Like anything early in the process, it limits what you can do later in the process. Like the coffee flavor is always going to be there. It's not going to go away. You're not going to know the strength of how much you've added until you're done brewing it and serving it. So you can't control the strength. But if you do it a few times and you like the flavor, then I'm sure you can dial it in. You're committed to dialing it in at that point. So Well, and, and you know, again, this is sort of the, I mean, you know, very, very far removed, but sort of the idea behind, uh, you know, Golden Stout is that you are using coffee in place of the roasted grains in order to kind of emulate some of the roasted grain characteristics in that beer without adding all of that color. What I would be curious to see is not using any roasted grains at all. So you design some simple blonde ale, uh, maybe with some some lighter crystal malts to add a little back, background sweetness. But then you you grind, uh, you know, say six ounces of coffee beans and add that to the mash. And then you add six ounces of whole beans to the mash of the other batch. Is one of them going to be darker than the other? I mean, after a one hour, you know, mash rest, I would imagine that it would be that. Uh, it would be a difference in appearance, but would it also contribute to a, a perceptible difference on the palate? It would make sense to me if it did. So again, like I said, we've got a lot to explore here. And I like Chris's idea here of just using beans instead of roasted barley. I would contend you are going to get a, a pretty noticeably different characteristic, though. Uh, there are differences in the way uh, beans are processed or roasted than there are barley. Uh, obviously, they're different different animals all, all in and of themselves. So, uh, but very good idea, Chris, something we'll explore in the future. Well, Andy, that's all I've got on brewing with hot and cold brewed coffee. How about you, man? I don't know. It's been pretty early right now. I haven't had my cup of joe yet, so I think I'll go have one now. I think I'm going to have my second. So, well, don't forget to subscribe to the Brew Lab podcast where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through them.